Hi guys, welcome back to another Hugh Jeffries video. In this video, I'm going to be reviving one of the greatest pieces of tech history, the iPod. This specific model being the fifth generation released in 2006. This one has a dead hard drive and is having issues holding a decent charge. It also has various marks and scratches, which I'm going to attempt to remove from the device. Currently, when plugged in, it shows a sad iPod sign directing the user to visit Apple support. However, Apple would no longer service this iPod given its age. But that isn't going to stop us from repairing it in this video. There are various sad noises coming from that mechanical hard drive, so that will definitely need to be replaced. Now, when replacing the drive, there are three options you can really go for. A replacement hard drive, a compact flash adapter or SD card adapter, which is ideal for up to 128 gigs, or an MSATA SSD adapter, which you can really go nuts and put up to say one or two terabytes in an iPod Classic. Now I'm gonna be using a 64 gig SD card, but of course I'll need to open the iPod to put that in. To get the iPod open, you'll need to use various plastic tools and picks to separate the screen from the back frame. However, you don't want to use any metal tools as you will damage either the front or back of the iPod. Once you've got it open, you want to be careful of the battery cable, so you need to sort of rotate the bottom before you can lift up on the connector and remove the cable from the socket. Now, once you fold it over and being careful of the ribbon cable that connects to the back, we can remove the dying battery and put that aside. Now I'll also take out the hard drive at this point, which all you really need to do is lift it up and disconnect the ZIF connector and remove it from the iPod. Now I'm going to be separating the two halves, so I'll need to disconnect its flex cable. Now once the back of the iPod has been removed, this is everything I need to take apart for this iPod, and you can see just how easy and quick this was to take apart. Certainly something we've lost over the years. Now I'm going to be trying to remove as many scratches as possible, so I brought this. I was recommended this by one of the employees at my local hardware store as it's supposed to remove scratches from stainless steel. Now the first issue I ran into was that it's literally rock hard, which isn't really good if I'm trying to apply it to the back of an iPod. So I heated it up with my solder rework station and sure enough, it actually was able to be applied to a microfiber cloth so I could start rubbing away at the back of an iPod Classic. This one is actually from one of the abandoned iPods that I found. I used this because I didn't really mind scratching up the housing if it did damage it, and sure enough, it didn't remove scratches, it actually just added to the giant mess. So that didn't really work, so I actually used some Brasso um, and applied way too much to the back of the iPod there, uh, and just used the microfiber cloth again and gave it a good polish, and sure enough, it actually undone most of the damage caused by the scratch remover. Now, coming across to the actual back housing from this iPod we're reviving, it was time to give it a go with the Brasso, and hopefully we'll get the same results as we did with the test housing. Just apply it and rubbing it in with a microfiber cloth. This doesn't remove the scratches, but it does polish up the metal and make it look a lot better than it did. I would have liked to try and find a way to remove the scratches from the iPod, but I couldn't seem to do it uh, with anything I could find locally, so this was just going to have to do for the video. Anyway, it looks so much better than it did from the start, and although you can still see the scratches, they are a lot less noticeable than they were before. So I also decided to try this on the screen, which is made of plastic, and sure enough, it didn't damage it, which was quite surprising, as this is a metal polisher and isn't designed for plastic. It actually brought it up really, really good, and with some scrubbing and cleaning it off, you can see it actually brought it up quite nice. Didn't remove the scratches, but there's not too many noticeable scratches on the screen anyway. With those two halves of the iPod all polished up and ready to go, it's time to give the bezel of the iPod a bit of a clean before I put the two halves back together. Coming back to the other half, I'm going to remove the adhesive left behind from the old battery. I'll clean it up as best I can using some alcohol. This will just make the new battery adhesive stick nicely to the back of the iPod so the battery won't be rattling around. The replacement battery I purchased for this I got from eBay and you can see it is 650 milliamp hours. I can remove the back adhesive and install it into the iPod. Pressing it down into place, making sure everything is seated in correctly. 
With that good to go, I can now reconnect the two halves of the iPod by connecting the one flex cable that goes between the two halves, making sure it's lined up and pressed in enough before I lock it down. Now moving across to the replacement flash storage, like I said earlier, I'm going to be using a compact flash adapter. However, after I purchased this adapter for a few bucks off eBay, I realized how expensive compact flash cards really were. So I brought this adapter so I could reuse this 64 gig SD card, which I originally purchased to film YouTube videos on. However, 64 gigs is way too small of a storage size. So I'm gonna utilize that card and put it into this iPod Classic. Now this is quite easy to install, you just need to connect the cable and place it down. I did notice however it moved around a little bit and I thought that this was a good opportunity to use these little pieces of rubber from the original hard drive to stop it moving around and keep it nice and secure. So I attached those to both sides of the new compact flash adapter and hoped for the best. With those installed, I can actually fix up this little dock surround port which I actually broke getting into the iPod. If you apply too much force around the dock connector, you're likely to break this as it's a very thin piece of plastic. However, they're only about a dollar on eBay, so that wasn't a big deal at all. With the new one installed, I can now finally test out this iPod Classic. I'll make sure to connect the battery connector first, being very gentle with the connector as they are very fragile and easy to break. Once the battery has been reconnected, I'm only going to press down the bottom portion of the iPod, which will allow us to plug in the 30 pin cable. The reason for this is it's a good idea to test the iPod before you put it all together. Now, as you can see, it says connect to iTunes, which is exactly the screen we're looking for. And sure enough, connecting the iPod to a computer, it shows up in iTunes and I can restore the iPod to factory settings. This only takes a couple of minutes because the actual firmware size is really small after it's complete, the iPod will show up on the desktop and you can see it's recognized as a 64 gig unit. I can then select the language on the iPod and we're good to go. Now it's time to clip in the top and we're basically done with the iPod, right? Well, there was a slight issue. It wasn't closing properly. I found out that the issue was actually these pieces of rubber which were just adding a little bit too much thickness for that compact flash card. With those removed, the iPod sealed up just fine. So this is it, we've successfully revived this iPod from 2006. This is a fifth generation and is now fully functioning and is in decent condition on both the back and front. Obviously there's some scratches which I couldn't remove, but those are purely cosmetic. Now in terms of cost, this set me back $34 for all the parts, plus the cost of the SD card, which for me was $34, but obviously that is going to vary on size and make. This iPod, however, is now functioning just fine, and you can see uh, it is actually detected as a 60 gigabyte model. And from what I understand, the OS is only able to understand in 10 gigabyte increments. So if you put 128 gigs, it will only show up as 120 gigabytes. Now I'm certain there's gonna be some people out there wondering what happened to the two iPods that I found that were completely abandoned and left outside for over two years. I still haven't got any further with these devices. The silver one still doesn't turn on and the black one still isn't detecting any sort of storage, hard drive, compact flash adapter or anything. Hopefully one day I'll get them to work, but for now I wouldn't be holding up too much hope for these devices. With that being said, I am going to make a crazy spec iPod Classic in an upcoming video, chucking in a huge SSD and a giant battery. This has to be hands down one of the most repairable and upgradable devices of its size, something which is almost non-existent in modern devices, with the latest iPod having almost everything soldered on, including its battery. With enough luck, this iPod fifth generation will continue rocking on for another 14 years. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button and consider checking out the restoration playlist for more videos just like this one. Also, make sure to follow me on my social media, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.